this week's drive, we see Superman set another record on a dirt bike. Watch a very expensive five second race. Join the Ferrari fight back. And answer a question no one asked. All this and more in this week's Drive. We start with a look at the way that the reigning Formula One world champions, Ferrari and Michael Schumacher, are handling the threat to their crowns. A week before his triumphant return to form at the Italian Grand Prix at Monza, Michael treated his loyal German fans to an up-close and personal display at the Nürburgring. At this stage, Michael was just one point ahead of his nearest rival, Juan Pablo Montoya, but Ferrari queried the tyres being used by the opposition and lodged a complaint, saying Michelin's tyres exceeded the 270mm tread width limit. Michelin changed their tyres for the Italian Grand Prix. The five times world champion admitted that improved cars, not rule changes, had closed the gap between Ferrari and rivals Williams and McLaren. I don't think it is because of the rules, but rather that three teams have built really competitive cars which are of a very similar standard. Rules can be set up at any time, but if there is a difference in the speed of the different cars, then that will always show up at some point. Rules benefit those that have the best car, and this year it was an extremely close-run thing. This was a chance for his followers to get much closer to the action than is possible during the high-pressure sessions at race meetings. This year has been more pressured than most. Last year he went to Monza having won 10 races and the title. This year he'd won just four. At Monza, he led from start to finish and opened up a slight gap on Montoya and Raikkonen. Brother Ralph, who missed Monza through injury, can no longer win the title. Similarly, only the top three can still win, with a maximum of 18 points available for a 1-2 at the last two rounds, Indianapolis in America and Suzuka in Japan. Two days after Monza, all three teams were testing ahead of the final two rounds in this year's championship, both of which will be vital in deciding the drivers' and constructors' titles. Ferrari team boss Jean Tot believes that his cars, and most particularly the tyres, have another problem to overcome. You know, we have been penalised quite a lot uh, with very hot uh, weather temperatures. But I don't think we should take that uh, as an excuse, but just uh, as a fact. And uh, we know that in hot weather uh, temperatures, uh, the whole package was not performing as well as it did, for example, in Silverstone. So. Hopefully, the temperature for the last Grand Prix will be cooler, so, so should suit us probably better. Both Tot, a former World Rally champion navigator, and Michael have learned to speak Italian, and this has endeared them to Ferrari's huge and fiercely partisan army of fans, known simply as the Tifosi. No, I will say I will make a big distinction between the media pressure and the Tifosi pressure. And I would say I respect more the Tifosi pressure because, um, I mean, those people, they are more dedicated to Ferrari. They are more trying to understand and to support Ferrari. Um, and uh, definitely to have the Tifosi around us is very pleasing. Schumacher's average speed of 247.585 kilometers an hour in the Italian Grand Prix beat the previous mark set by Peter Gethin in 1971. The British driver's 32-year-old record average speed was 242.615 kilometers an hour. The question marks over the legitimacy of Michelin's tires was highlighted when the FIA announced that they would measure tire width after races and not beforehand. As a result, Michelin were forced to construct new, slimmer molds for their front tires. However, the Furore could still rumble on long after the season ends on the track. According to Jean Tot, the Italian team will consider appealing against Michelin's past results if they don't win the championship in the remaining races of the season. The option to appeal the results is open until the 30th of November. Meanwhile, elsewhere, the focus was further into the future of Formula One. From 2005 onwards, the Formula One circus will number Turkey among its venues, 
and construction on the new track has officially begun on the outskirts of the country's largest city, Istanbul. The 100 million US dollar project has been launched following the signing of a seven-year contract by Formula One supremo Bernie Eccleston and Turkish officials in London last month. Eccleston traveled to Turkey for the official startup of civil engineering work on the site of the new track, and Istanbul residents were invited along to see what their city would be a part of. I would uh, say that this uh, circuit is going to be more exciting circuit than the existing circuits. Uh, it has a fantastic uh, take, you know, overtaking, and it has a fantastic fast bends, and it has a fantastic uh, up and down hills. So it's not just you know a straight uh, circuit; it's an exciting circuit. Bernie Eccleston claimed he favoured Istanbul ahead of other candidates because it is more easily reached by road from other European Formula One venues. The fact that tobacco advertising isn't banned in Turkey might also play a part. Um, I've noticed when we've had new events in various parts of the world that not only we brought thousands of people to visit the events, but just as important, it's exposed different types of people that perhaps wouldn't have thought of investing in a country to come to the, when they come to the event, to have a look around and think, my God, we should be investing here. And anyone that doesn't think that about Turkey really should give it some very serious thought because what I've seen over the few years I've been visiting here is that um, Turkey is really not only just part of the world and not only a part of Europe, but uh, a major part, and I'm sure it's going to be in the future. Turkish Prime Minister Tayyip Erdogan also attended the ceremony, his government having promised to cover the costs of hosting the race. Türkiye'nin güzel İstanbul'umuzun 2005 yılı itibariyle it is an honor to see that our beautiful city of Istanbul has been added to the F1 calendar as of 2005. We are hoping that very soon Istanbul will start to reap the benefits from this complex and this major sporting event, the beginnings of which we are celebrating today. After the Turkish Premier had spoken, he and Eccleston jointly switched on the concrete pumping machine. Istanbul is a sprawling city of more than 10 million people that links Europe and Asia Minor. The track is being built near the newly completed second airport on the Asian side of the city. Environmentalists opposed the project because the track is on the site of a water basin, but officials dismissed their objections. This is probably in no small part due to the fact that the Grand Prix is expected to bring three million tourists to Turkey. It sits one person and has only three wheels, and it's set to speed across Australia without using a drop of fuel. It's the Nuna 2, a sun-powered car developed by Dutch students to compete against giant car makers in the World Solar Challenge in Australia. Some 40 teams are expected from all over the world to compete in the 3,010-kilometer race from the northern city of Darwin to Adelaide in the south. The Dutch won the last race in 2001, and this year's team is hoping to defend the title with a new car. Just like the previous model, the Nuna 2 is equipped with solar cells developed by Europe's space agency. The cells on Nuna 2, triple junction gallium arsenide cells, are among the most advanced in the world. Identical solar cells have been exposed to the rigors of use outside the atmosphere. The student team also worked hard to improve the aerodynamics and the weight of their car. From our competition, we know that they've uh, continued to use their old car and made improvements on their old car. Um, but we've built an entirely new car, uh, which, uh, which means that we've improved on the three, uh, three parts that I mentioned, the aerodynamics, the solar cells, and the uh, extreme weight loss. So uh, given all these points, uh, we think that we have a, a big chance of uh, defending our title in Australia. Nuna 1 took the win in the World Solar Challenge two years ago. 
The average speed of the car was 91 kilometers an hour, a new record. On the fourth day, Nuna had to travel 830 kilometers, a record distance for a single day, achieved by driving at more than 100 kilometers an hour, also a record. Nuna 1 carried maximum power point trackers, small devices to balance power from the battery and the solar cells, even in less favorable conditions like shade and cloud. The top speed will probably be around 160 kilometers an hour, um, but we probably won't be making that during the race because during the race we have to save energy and uh, be very responsible with the energy that we take up from the sun. So during the race we're expecting to get an average speed of about 100 kilometers an hour. Unlike Nuna 1, the new car sends data from the solar panels to a support vehicle where the team calculates optimum speed according to the weather forecast. They're pretty confident that they will retain their title in Australia again this year. The final round of this year's European Drag Racing Championship moved to the historic Santa Pod Raceway in England, where local star Smax Smith was in the running to win the top fuel title in his first year in the class. Only Sweden's Mikael Kagered stood in the way. Some you win, some you lose. Watch again as Kagered's engine explodes. The cars run on dangerous nitromethane fuel and a broken hose pumped five litres of it onto the hot exhaust manifold. Despite the blow-up, he crossed the line in 5.6 seconds at over 194 miles an hour. At the same meeting last year, Kagered survived a crash when his dragster was also destroyed. What can anyone say? This is a fairy tale. This is, this is a dream come true. I've just had so many people behind me. I mean, the Purple Loans people have been fantastic. They just backed me up right through this. Never heard, hearing a drag racing, 12 months ago, they never even heard of it. Most of the people have never even been here. And then now in front of a home crowd, I've won this event, we won the main event, and now I'm the rookie. This is my 30th year drag racing, and now I'm top fuel champion, top fuel number one. In the Methanol Dragster event, Britain Dave Wilson took European honours when he beat Germany's Peter Schufer. The two have been in a close battle for the lead all year, swapping wins and records, but Wilson secured the win by a few hundredths of a second, reaching 260 miles an hour. It is the tightest, toughest championship I've ever, ever been in, and to win it, um, like for all the crew and for everybody else, I mean, it's absolutely brilliant. Sweden's Roger Johansson, after spending all year fighting off compatriot Hakan Nilsson, won the Pro Modified Series. Roger, in his nitrous-injected car, won by the narrowest of margins and promised to return next year to defend his title. Thank you, thank you. This is very good. Now we're the champion and we won this event and we have been in all finals. So it's very good for us. Sweden's Per Bengston won the Super Twin bike category. At 200 miles an hour, he took enough points during the semi-final to guarantee a win. Bengston, who built his own bike, was a popular winner, having been at the top of the leaderboard all year. Alice Springs in Outback Australia hosted the 28th running of the famous Fink Desert Race. With 400 entrants in motorcycle and car categories, the event is held over a rugged 460-kilometre course from Alice Springs to the remote township of Fink and back again. Specialist off-road racing buggies capable of over 200 kilometres an hour were expected to claim this year's King of the Desert title. Favourites included reigning Australian off-road champion Max Burrows from the southern state of Victoria. Another favourite, David Fellows from the Northern Territory, however, wouldn't make it past Rodinga, 92 kilometres from the start. John Pattard was another driver to have his fair share of drama out on the course. That left the way open for the defending champion, Burrows, to greet the chequered flag in first position. It was the fifth victory for Burrows in the event, driving a 2.2-litre turbo Jimco buggy. He completed the course in 57 seconds under four hours. Second place went to Hayden Tatnell from Tasmania, 16 minutes behind. Hey, come on. Hey. Stephen Greenfield would benefit from having to contend with less dust by starting early, and the race was now on to see if any of the riders could beat the time set by Burrows and claim the King of the Desert title. 
The racing saw some spectacular incidents, including this one for Chris Clabe of Alice Springs, who was able to walk, or at least hobble, away. Bike racers especially have a tough time of it in Australia as the infamous fine red dust hides savage potholes and corrugations and constantly gets into eyes and nostrils. Thousands of people braved freezing overnight temperatures to camp alongside the track for the race. In the end, Darren Griffiths from the mining town of Kalgoorlie in Western Australia and riding a KTM 540 took out bike honours, but his time was slower than the leading buggy, thus giving the coveted King of the Desert title to Burroughs. Griffith's time for the event was 4 hours, 11 minutes and 42 seconds, or nearly 12 minutes off the pace. Second bike home was Mark Sladek on a Husaberg, five minutes behind. Last year's bike winner, Rick Hall of the Northern Territory, came in third on a Honda CR500, a minute further back. All right, guys, thank you very much. Prince Edward, Earl of Wessex, and MG Rover Chief Executive Kevin Howe unveiled the five millionth Rover car built since production began in 1904. The car will be kept by the company as part of the centenary celebrations next year. Afterwards, the Prince chatted with human staff at the Longbridge plant, where Rover cars have been rolling off the production line for almost a century, while robots got on with the job of building cars. The car market in Britain is currently booming, with sales 16% up on last year. Rover's chairman plays down the company's poor domestic market share, less than 4%, but is clearly hoping that new models will secure a bigger slice of the small car market. We've always taken a position that we're not a business that actually makes money out of market share. We actually make money out of selling cars on a reasonably profitable basis. So that's what we've continued to do. Um, and I think. You know, you've only got to see, it, see the place, see the people, see the products in the place to see that it's a business with a great future. After unveiling the new rover, Prince Edward got the feel of the first model rover ever produced, way back in 1904. The company is confident that after a century, it will still be at the forefront of car producing for many years to come. There was bright sunshine for the final event of the 2003 Motocross World Championship, and the 125cc race started with three riders able to take the title. Predictably, Stefan Everts got away at the start, and the 30-year-old seven-times world champion never looked back. Alessio Ciodi of Italy on bike 23 and Frenchman Luigi Sagai on 40 were left behind as Everts disappeared, and Andrea Bartolini, third in the standings, battled to keep up. Points leader Steve Ramon of Belgium had only to finish in the top 17 to guarantee his first world title. In the end, Ramon, the runner-up for the past two years, crossed the line in fifth place behind winner Everts to claim the championship. The riding was not so not so smooth like it used to be, but uh, yeah, was not uh, was was good for the championship. So uh, yeah, I'm really happy. I'm, I'm now uh, number one. Although Ramon won only one race all season, consistency gave him the title. Next year, he moves up to the MXGP class. In contrast, Everts didn't race in the first three rounds of the 125 series and won seven of the eight that he did enter, finishing third in the other. Pole position in the MXGP race went to another Belgian multiple world champion, Joel Smets, but again it was Everts who made the early running in his second race of the day. Smets claimed the 650 world title at the previous round. Everts had already claimed the title in this class, his record-breaking seventh world crown. Smets stalled his bike and came seventh, his second worst result this year after seven second places. This left the podiums to be decided between Everts, Denmark's Brian Jorgensen and Joshua Coppins of New Zealand. But again, Everts took the chequered flag to underline his dominance, his ninth straight win in the class. Everts, a clear winner then, scoring double wins in MXGP and the 125s eight times this year, but with five factories powering the top six riders. If Smets was looking to regain some pride in his favourite event, the Big Banger 650 race, he was going to be disappointed. 
The two Belgians, Everts on 72 and Smets on three, slugged it out for the lead. Smets crashed, trying to pressure Everts, racing his first 650 event of the season and trying for a unique triple win. But as his team began to cheer, Everts too went to ground, but kept the engine running, remounted and carried on racing. Spain's Javier Garcia Vico went through into first place, but Everts gradually reeled him in, overtaking to an ovation from the 15,000 strong crowd. Everts duly completed a clean sweep of wins at Erni, a unique feat likely to stand for years to come. Smets finished third to go through the entire season with a podium finish in every race. Everts was understandably exhausted. Winning three uh, GPs in one day, uh... It's for sure the first and last time I've done that, and I would never do it the second time. Uh, it's been so tough. Afterwards, Zevitz enjoyed a glass of champagne with former world champion and very proud father, Harry. This was the last 650 GP before the world championship structure is streamlined to MX1 or MXGP and MX2 for 125 two strokes and 254 strokes next year. And finally, we all know that Formula One drivers live in a rarefied world of privilege and money, indulging their every fantasy about yachts, helicopters, and skinny little three-wheelers that lean into corners. BAR driver Jensen Button was recently invited to play with something unusual. Two of them, in fact. This is a Carver. It's built in Holland, has a 660cc turbocharged engine, and will reach 180 kilometers an hour. It's hand-built, costs about 60,000 euro, and is probably the very clever answer to a question that nobody thought to ask. This car or bike, whatever you want to call it, is possibly the weirdest thing I've ever driven. I think it might be a bit of a squeeze with two people, though. Someone else in the back. Let's see what it can do. Fantastic on a twisty road. When you leaned over all the way, the steering changes quite a bit. You lose a bit of sensation and it starts to feel more like a motorcycle. As if that wasn't enough, Button, who's England's most experienced current Formula One driver, was invited to sample a V24 Bat Boat, an altogether much more serious bit of kit. This is unbelievable. This is more scary than getting into an F1 car, this. It's great, it's great to go in something, you know, so different. It's very different, obviously, we're going along tarmac, so it's very, very smooth, whereas this is bouncing around a lot more. That's, that's one of the big differences. Um, also, obviously, there's not as much grip as on asphalt, but uh, it's a lot of fun. The Rendell V24 One Design Offshore Race Boat is an American-made, Swedish-designed two-seater racer, and well-heeled contestants can rent one on an arrive-and-drive basis. The design is very forgiving for rookie drivers and throttlemen as they master the phenomenal performance. A race, love to. So whether you like your action sandy, quick or silent, so you stay on track and up to speed, make sure you catch next week's Drive.